So what happens when a lifelong Trekkie watches classic Doctor Who for the first time? Find out here as I, Mike, from the Rewatch Project podcast, watch classic Doctor Who for the first time. Namely, the seventh and final part of the original Dalek serial, The Rescue. Before getting on to that, just want to remind everybody that I appreciate comments on the comment section here on YouTube, and please do check out the Rewatch Project with Hannah and Mike, my primary audio podcast that you will also find on this feed. Uh, there's been some great commentary in the comments page. Um, a lot of great advice. A couple of people have suggested that maybe I take a look at the um, the big screen adaptation of this, the, I guess, non-canonical Peter Cushing starring Doctor Who and the Daleks from 1965, the following year from this 1964 episode. So I will probably get to that directly after this episode. But in the meantime, like, subscribe, share and comment. Let's watch the final part of the Daleks. I'm really excited about this. Not going to miss these guys, not going to lie. I think this is the second serial, um, and I think, and also the second time where maybe we've spent a little bit too long with our secondary characters, or maybe just that the secondary characters aren't quite interesting enough to warrant that time. It's, no good here. it's almost like a radio play here, isn't it? They're really Get describing down. the action. It's as though they're doing it for a, an audio audience. I guess that's a carryover from radio and also, you know, TVs were very small and, you know, obviously low definition then. So I guess more signposting, oh, it's going to happen. More signposting for the action was probably required. It's always very useful when they explain their plan. I love that they actually are using their plungers for uh, practical devices, for practical reasons. They are the kind of Swiss Army monsters. This senseless evil killing... Great to see the humanity of the Doctor coming through. These sort of um... you know, anger at the inhumanity. Ian's cardigan's taking quite a beating. Again, this is this has sort of elements of um, journey to the centre of the Earth as well. This idea of questing their way through feels very um, contemporaneous with a lot of the um, fantasy and sci-fi filmmaking or literature that was popular in adaptation at the time it would seem. Here, give me a hand. Traveling under the pipes all the time. Uh, Matt Paint or Matt Photo. Alison? The Daleks must have captured them. It is an interesting parallel to Star Trek, and I'm going to make lots of these, you know, Star Trek fan watching Doctor Who for the first time. The idea that in Star Trek, their prime directive was a non-interference directive, um, but constantly you would get broken. It was something that the show paid lip service to, but it loved the idea of it, but it understood that it was dramatically restricting. You know, it was great for Kirk to say, hey, you know, we need to not fight. But the reality is uh, that A, that's boring television. And B, um, it's actually wrong. <laughs> you know, sometimes you do need to fight and you do need to support and equip people. But it was an anti-colonial thing, essentially. It was saying, hey, you know, the wisdom of bringing fire and religion to uh, and government to the natives is not always a pure uh, or correct impulse. Um, what we're seeing here is kind of the opposite of it. And the idealism of the Thal is kind of being portrayed as being um, ineffective. The Thal are actually kind of closer to the evolved federation of Star Trek, where it's held up as being this positive thing, even though the reality is that Captain Kirk still finds plenty of people to punch. You know, so here it is. It's interesting. It's, it's moving in the same circles. It's still the 60s. This is much earlier in the 60s, and it still is reflecting that idealism. But there is an element of pragmatism here that I don't think you see in Star Trek that's actually pretty sophisticated and quite interesting. Now listen, everybody. There's also an element of like the Magnificent Seven or the Seven Samurai, the um, the Akira Kurosawa film that, that it was based on, where you do see heroes kind of arming the poor farmers to defend themselves against the bullies, you know, and that's very much the classic um heroic power down to half i do not believe you but i have you truly have you are not capable of creating such a machine and you 
I love that the idea, the sort of again, the the Daleks of a kind of a dark shadow or the other side of the coin to the Doctor because they've got all of their own hubris. You know, they can't believe that somebody else would be able to uh, have the level of technology or even potentially access to something that surpasses the level of technology that they've got. It's, it, it sounds kind of like something that the Doctor would say, ironically. What did it look like? A small rod with metal at either end. It belongs to my ship. Explain its secrets to you and its philosophy of movement. Now we know of philosophy of movement. I like that. But you can't operate it without me. Is there a sort of sense here that the, the TARDIS is some kind of living machine? I Again, I know nothing about the deeper mythology of the Doctor, but um, there's been a couple of times now when there's been an implication that the TARDIS has a greater level of complexity to it than just a sort of space-time ship. Has Sneaking down corridors, caves and corridors lifting heavy heavy polystyrene boulders there three of my favorites it's very comforting to see them in this franchise as well they do all look alike it's the architecture of the fascist what's your head darling god yeah it must have been difficult monitoring the uh, sound levels when they were doing this episode I mean, imagine that the Daleks themselves would be quite noisy. Much like the seagulls you can hear outside my window. Life in Wellington. Yeah, you get him, Ian. And considering as well that Ian is kind of, I suppose, relative to the Doctor, the action guy, it is all interesting that they've gone for a school teacher, a kind of for the kids watching the show, is a paternal figure, and obviously the, the Doctor is the kind of the the the, the grandfather, the grand paternal um, figure, because you know, I mean, the temptation certainly now, if they were to do that, uh, well, now obviously you know there'd be more diversity, but but in a more modern sensibility, I think they'd have gone for a younger, more virile, action-oriented character, and I think that that's a mistake that people often make is this understanding that kids want to watch other kids or young people. A lot of the stuff that I watched, uh, my hero when I was a kid was Han Solo, and he was an adult. He was in his 30s, you know. And it's, it reminds me of my, my own youth and watching TV shows where the heroes were people like my dad. You know, they were the aspirational figures. Parents and policemen and teachers. It definitely feels um, like a more innocent age. And I think that part of the comfort of going back and watching these arguably particularly as a british person you know albeit living in new zealand um you know a reminder of a time when there was less of a sense of cynicism about those figures and about those uh those male uh role models again love the forced perspective of the long corridor it's, it's just such simple tricks but real true stagecraft A lot of overlapping dialogue in this episode. Don't think we've had a line flood yet as well. We're on good form this episode. I suppose that's the other thing as well, is when this is being done essentially live, often, I guess an episode is only as good as how good everybody is on the day. How, you know, for want of a better phrase, how in the zone everybody is. Whereas I guess when you're shooting a, a, a modern TV show over you know two weeks uh, and it's been done kind of piecemeal, um, there's a lot more room for that. Whereas here it's kind of like you've got to get those energy levels up, otherwise the whole production sags. It is interesting to think about the appeal of the Daleks. I mentioned earlier on that I'll be doing the, the film Doctor Who and the Daleks, which is a clear reflection of how much the Daleks kind of punctured the zeitgeist at the time in the you know, early to mid 60s, because they are weird. They're such an odd eccentric design, but there's no way that that could have got workshopped. There's no way that that was um, designed by committee to be appealing or toyrific, as you know the term would become in the 90s when it comes to marketing to children, to mass audiences. Um, so what is it about them? What is it? And I'm still kind of unpacking that myself about the Daleks that was so. Um, evocative and captured the imagination 
Uh, I mean, I feel it. I understand it. But it's a tricky thing to articulate. I'm also getting there's going to be quite a lot of struggling with sliding doors going on in Doctor Who as well. If my other favourite franchises are anything to go by. Okay, it's like Hodor. Such a simple but cool effect. Kind of scary, kind of, kind of freaky. Can you imagine playing that on the playground and my friends making the Dalit noise and then being like Ugh! falling, imagining the uh, negative effect. Relentless countdown of the Daleks. Great staging here. You get a real sense of the geography and where they are and the sense of tension as well. And that must have been really difficult to do with the, I guess, the filming restrictions and the size of the equipment and the relative smallness of space and these, you know, mechanical Daleks and all of these elements. It's really impressive. See, this is what's scary about the Daleks. They're just shouting to go and kill someone. And I... To answer my own question a little bit, I think that primal, single-minded aggressiveness is pretty scary. That's it. Bash him in. <laughs> Bop him on the head. You see, this is where the charm factor comes in, because, again, it would be really easy for a modern audience to look at this and say, well, you know, it's hardly high octane action. You know, it's very much like a play, very much kind of people rolling around and, uh, you know, you could make fun of that, I guess. But I think that would be a mistake and I think that that would be lazy and I think that that would be foolish um, because, again, you have to look at this within the context of the time. But I think in some ways it's actually advantageous to the show because it, it adds to the kind of playability I mean, again, I can imagine playing this on the playground or in the school field afterwards. And I think that the fact that there's something kind of um, relatable and attainable about the action on this really must have helped for show. Um, and I think it's not simply a question of hand-waving that. It's a, it's a question of looking at, this is the form, this is the medium. This isn't a movie. This isn't a modern television show. This is a television show from 1964, and this is absolutely right and appropriate and um, effective um, for that form. This is the titular escape. Hey, take that. What are you going to do, Doctor? Moral I dilemma. I don't know how. It's finished. The final war. 500 years of destruction end in this. No doubt you will have other wars to fight. Is that the Dalek equivalent of going belly up? You've got work to do. Some other way. Yeah, again, this, that's a very Star Trek thing, isn't it? Is, you know, not enjoying your victory, kind of hating the fact that you had to fight. Although the Daleks are dicks, to be fair, so. It's like he's surrounded by Playboy bunnies or something, this is isn't what it? what they call a compensator, my friend. We don't really know where you come from. Or why we build a whole new world. He's raising the question. Stay and help us. We could learn. Oh, no, no, no. I'm afraid I'm much too old to be a pioneer. Although I was one amongst my own people. Well, then stay and advise us, please. No, no. Oh, interesting. We're much too far away from home, my granddaughter. Pioneer. Thank you all the same. It's a nice gesture on your part. You wanted advice, you said. I never give it. Never. Yeah. But I might just say this to you. Always search for truth. My truth is in the stars. And yours... Is here. Brilliant. No, I'm you see, that's why Hartnell is great. You know, he can walk right up to the camera and he can do this stuff 
and he can sell it. And you can either do that or you can't. That's a charisma thing. That's an X Factor thing. It's an intangible thing, and it's why his casting was so it's great. Out of the question, but I might visit your grandchildren to find if they've learned the secrets. And if they have, well, who knows? I might live with them. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> my grandfather's in a terrific. Thank you, Diane. Such tourists. What are you up to, Sue? It's safely here, and there's no need to worry about me. Are you sure? Good. Thank you. Are we going to get a goodbye kiss? Goodbye, Genesis. Goodbye, you. Scandalous. We are back in the awesome TARDIS set. Running around, pulling the levers, pressing the buttons. Great Jules Vernian. What's happened there? Okay, so for a second time, we've had that... Uh, the quantum leap oh boy moment where we you know get a cliffhanger that's going to segue into our next serial so uh so that was the first daleks serial okay uh so that was a lot of fun it was really enjoy interesting to see uh, a different dynamic in the group uh of course the introduction of the daleks was really cool and you can completely understand why they became such a um cultural force just the design and the originality and the aggressiveness uh of them is just wonderful and simple but complex at the same time uh and i'm surprised at how fully formed they are here they look and sound like the daleks there's none of that kind of shonkiness that you sometimes get in the early appearance appearances of something so iconic and as i said before i mean particularly growing up in britain in the 70s and i can only imagine even more so in the mid to late 60s when the daleks were really peaking in their ubiquity that they were as iconic as, um, you know, the British Bobby and Big Ben and the Beatles and um, the Mini Car. You know, they're just part of that landscape. And here they are, fully formed. Um, a little bit like the first story in the sense that there is some sag, particularly around the sort of mid to late point in the serial. I think, again, that's a bit of a sign of the times. I can hand wave that a little bit where it did feel a very radio play. Uh, particularly when we're spending more time with the Tals, um, trying to find their way across to the Dalek stronghold. That did feel like they were milking that a little bit. You know, maybe that's where you feel the difference between a four-parter and a seven-parter. I mean, the seven-parter, that's a lot. That's, a, you know, three hours of, uh, of story. Um, but on the whole, I thought this was really great, and I bet it must have been an absolute blast at the time. But next, I am going to watch um, the Doctor Who and the Daleks film from 1965, um, the non-canon film starring Peter Cushing. I'm a big fan of Hammer and Amicus, but I've never seen this, so I think that I'll have a lot of fun with this, and I understand that this is an adaptation of sorts. So whilst maybe I'm not watching this at the right point from a strict chronology perspective, it feels like now is a good time to do it, and that can operate as a little bit of a sorbet between now and the next serial that I will get to. So uh, comments appreciated. Love the education that I'm getting from Doctor Who fans. They seem to be a friendly, fun, enthusiastic, and very welcoming bunch. So thank you so much for inviting me, this Star Trek fan, to your party, to your fandom. I very much appreciate that, and I look forward to being back with you in the next couple of days looking at the Daleks movie. <laughs>